Welcome to Great Loop Radio, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. I'm Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. It is Memorial Day weekend, and the canals in New York State and in Canada are open, so loopers will be headed that way shortly. So it's been a few years since United States citizens could travel into Canada. Um, the Canadian border opened up to welcome U.S. citizens back kind of in uh, mid to late August last year, which was a little bit late for many loopers. So the kind of bottom line of that is it's been a couple of years since most loopers were able to cross into Canada. So we are focusing today on how you go about crossing the border, checking in, et cetera. Karen Nettles from the Homeport crew has recently updated all of our information on this in preparation for an article that will be in the June Great Loop Link newsletter that goes out to all our, our members. So you can check out more details when that comes out on June 1st. But in the meantime, Karen is gonna join me today to update everyone on what those rules and regulations and the process is for US citizens to check into Canada. So before we dive in, I do wanna take a moment to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes and Associates, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners and viewers to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. Karen Nettles with the Homeport Crew, welcome back. Thanks, glad to be here today. Yeah, thanks for joining me to kind of share all of the details and, and the updates that, based on your most recent research. Um, it's been a little bit since most U.S. citizens were able to go to Canada, particularly aboard the boat. Um, and, you know, back several years ago, pre-COVID, we used to get questions about this all the time and some concern about this. We kind of noticed that hasn't been happening this season. And I think it's been so far off the radar for so many loopers for so long um, that a little bit of that uh, anxiety over crossing the border has disappeared, which is a good thing because it's really not very hard. Um, right. But we do want to update everybody on how you do this. And there are some small changes based on COVID or based on things, technologies that were developed during COVID. So right. let's go ahead and start. Um, you know, basically we have said that the border is open and Canada is welcoming U.S. citizens back. Um, but who can visit Canada? Because it's not completely open to everyone. So fill us in on that. Right. You do have to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Otherwise, you won't be able to go in. There's very limited restrictions. Um, but for the most part, you have to be fully vaccinated. And that means you have to have received at least two doses of a COVID-19 uh, accepted vaccine. And the Moderna and the Pfizer are accepted by vaccine. So you have to have two doses of that or you can have a mix of the two. Uh, as long as you have two doses or one dose of the Johnson & Johnson. Um, you have to have received your second dose at least 14 days before you enter Canada. So if you got your second dose on July 1st, you would not be eligible to enter Canada until July 15th. Um, and they also, the, sec the third and fourth doses, uh, you don't have to have that 14 day window and they do not reference that you have to be required to have the booster shot. So you just need the, the, the one shot from Johnson and Johnson or either the two doses from Moderna or Pfizer. So you're good to go. So the other thing is that you need to not have any COVID symptoms when you enter at the border. Um, they're, they're no longer requiring pre, pre testing. They were doing pre testing. They've stopped that. There's no longer a quarantine plan. You don't have to have that. Um, they also have updated it that partially are unvaccinated children ages 5 to 11 can enter in without no, co no COVID testing or, or anything as long as they're with a fully vaccinated adult. Okay. Uh, thank you for that update because that COVID information has been super confusing. Um, so those with two, two doses of vaccines are good to go. Those who don't um, have that, it, it may be a little bit late if you're just starting that process to go to Canada. Um, and for those who just are not interested in being vaccinated for whatever reason, um, you can do the Great Loop staying completely within the US, but uh, you will have to be able to get through the entire length of the Erie Canal, which is a 15 foot clearance. And we're not gonna go into great detail on that today because we're focusing on those who do plan to go to Canada. I should also mention um, that for our Canadian members who are, have these same questions about how they go about crossing into the US, 
we have recently done a webinar on that. So if you're an AGLCA member, if you log in and go to our webinars page from the information menu, you can find the recording with those details. So just a couple of notes about what we're not talking about today. Um, so Karen, assuming um, someone who is fully vaccinated and is planning to go to Canada, so there's some things that they should do ahead of time before approaching the border, right? So what are the first steps? Right. They do have a, a mobile app and an online uh, web page that you need to access. And so you need to download that to your smartphone or your tablet. So you can find that in your, you know, your app store. No big deal. It's Arrive Can is what it's called. Um, so that needs to be downloaded. That way you can upload your travel and, and vaccine documentation. And then it takes you about 10 to 15 minutes to set up the account. And if by chance you already have Arrive Can on your, your mobile device, then you just need to make sure it's updated to the latest version, which they released last, this month, earlier this month, and that's version 2.29. Um, there is, if you don't want to download it to your phone or a tablet or anything, there is an online version so you can access it by computer as well. Okay, so you're putting in your passport information, your vaccination information, that's kind of the basics of what they're collecting there in Arrive Can. Right, yeah, and you'll have to do that within 72 hours of, our, of arrival. So you would be putting in your travel documentation, like you said, your passport information and that sort of thing. If you're doing it through the app, they do have a, a scanning technology that allows you to upload it quickly and easily. Um, so you can do that and then you would be putting in your contact and travel details, you know, all of your passengers, the purpose of your travel, whether it's for business or leisure, you know, when you're going to arrive and your port of arrival. And then, of course, you would put in your vaccination information. Um, you can certainly take a picture as long as they're well lit photos. Those are permissible of your, your vaccine cards and so forth. And you can also enter up to eight travelers at one time as long as they have the same vaccination status and they are traveling for the same purposes and they're of the same citizenship. Um, if you have somebody on your boat that doesn't, you you don't have all the same requirements or, or status, then you would need to upload separate submissions for each individual. And then when you uh, submit everything, then you receive a receipt. You'll see the re receipt on the screen and you'll also get an email confirmation of that. So that's not saying that you're going to be able to enter Canada. That's just saying that you've entered the information and, and they'll review and you know, accept you at the, at the border when you get there. Um, if by chance some of your information needs to change after you've submitted it and you've gotten the receipt, you can re-enter information and the system will clear out the, the initial submission you did and, and accept the second one that you do. Okay, and you mentioned a 72 hour window that's um, mm -hmm. within the 72 hours before you arrive or you need to do it within that 72 hours before you arrive or prior to 72 hours before you arrive. Uh, within the 72 hours so just as long as it's in that 72 hour window. Okay, great. Um, I know your article mentions a, another feature or two of arrive can that loopers may be interested in using can you share just a little bit about that. Um, yeah, they have it's a, a save traveler feature. So it's an optional feature if you want to save all of your information. So it's already in there. So you don't have to, you know, upload it for reentry at another point in time. If you do save the information, you're you can go in there and you can you can delete and add or edit the information at any time, but it just allows you to save it. And so you don't have to re-upload it at another time. Um, the other thing I've neglected to mention about the the your vaccine status once you upload everything and arrive can and then when you get your submission you should see a an, an A or V or an I by your name or the other traveler's name if you don't see that then you either forgot to upload your vaccination information or either you're not that fully vaccinated according to Canada's requirements but you should see one of those three letters by your name. Okay. One of the big kind of uh, points of contention or points of confusion so far this season has been with the reporting sites when you're when you're arriving in Canada. Um, initially, the list of sites that came out for this season was substantially reduced from the pre-COVID list of reporting sites, and that was affecting some uh, many travelers, but some loopers as well. 
uh, I understand that that's been changed a bit. So what is the current status of the reporting sites and where you should go when you check into Canada? Um, yes, like you said, they did have limited um, sites available where people could check in. They have opened up significantly within the last week and they're continuing to open up more sites. So I should see fairly, fairly soon, we should see that all of the sites are open. Um, but the ArriveCam app has not caught up yet. They're trying to get that updated as quickly as they can. So what they are saying on their website is that you, you know, if you're working through your ArriveCam submission and you do not see your preferred port of entry, then just select one so that you can continue to go through the ArriveCam application to fully submit it. And then you just go to your designated um, port of entry. So, but they, they are updating those and they are opening up. So just make sure you just, um, like I said, select one if it's not in your, in the app and just select one and then go to the port of entry that is your desired place that you want to go. Okay, perfect. So as you're um, approaching the border, um, you do need to check in using ArriveCan. Um, but let me clarify that if you are you know, for example, cruising the Thousand Islands area where it kind of straddles the border of the US and Canada, you don't have to check in when you cross into Canadian water, waters, especially if you're planning to cross back over to the US. You do have to check in essentially if you uh, touch ground in Canada. So if you're docking or even if you're anchoring and that anchor is therefore touching ground in Canada, that's the time when you should check in. So Karen, kind of walk us through the process of what to do when you arrive in Canada and are planning on touching ground there. Sure. Um, you would do one of two things. You'll either call the Canadian Border Services Agency. They have a number for remote entry. That number is 1-888-226-7277. Or you report to a marine reporting site to you know, do a, a physical face-to-face -face, um, approval for entry. So you can do it either remotely or go face-to-face -face either way. Okay, so you either have to, you don't use the ArriveCan app for that, though. You either call or you go face to face. Is that correct? Right. You call in and, and then, like I said, obviously they access your ArriveCan information. So when you do check in, then they are going to ask you some health screening questions, you know, about your vaccination status and, you know, health screening. You know, do you have symptoms now? They're going to ask for, you know, full name, name of birth, citizenship, you know, what's your link to stay in Canada? What's your purpose for traveling? You know, where do you intend to go? And then they're going to ask about your, you know, passports and that sort of thing, your proof of vaccination. They're going to want to know about your arrive can receipts, um, passenger information, and then declaring information, you know, goods and, and goods and services and um, not goods and goods, not goods and services, but goods um, and the currency that you're going to declare for the passengers on board. And, okay. and then they also have the option. There is random COVID testing. So you could be picked for random COVID testing okay. as well. And I do want to go through some of those declarations because that's something that has created some questions and stress for people in the past. So right. we'll dive into that next, but I do want to take a moment to play a message from one of our sponsors. So we'll pick up there when we come back, back in a moment. Our friends at DocMate offer the world's most advanced, affordable, and safest wireless remote control system for your boat's engines, pods, thrusters, anchor, and horn. Once you activate the DocMate remote control with a simple push of a button, you are able to leave the helm where visibility is oftentimes limited and then confidently and safely control your boat's movement from anywhere aboard. The result is less stress and a safer experience during typical docking maneuvers, particularly in tight marina slips and when navigating through locks where potential damage might only be a matter of feet or just inches away. Learn more at DocMate.us. We're back on Great Loop Radio. Today we are talking about the procedures for United States citizens to enter Canada, which many will be doing shortly for the first time in a few years. Karen Nettles with the Homeport crew is filling us in on those details. Um, Karen, you just kind of explained that when you arrive and are ready to check in, you uh, call the telephone reporting number um, or you can check in physically face to face at one of the reporting sites um, and that they will ask you a series of questions about what you have to declare. Um, so tell us a little bit, first of all, about what is restricted, you know, the things that you should remove from the boat before you enter Canada. Sure. Um, some of the common items that they list there is obviously an extensive list and you can go to their website to check them out. But some of the more common things that, that they do list to, to mention that you should or restrict or prohibited is, of course, firearms and weapons. Um, 
to give a little more information on that, you know, there are some exceptions for firearms. You would have to show documentation and those types of exceptions. You would have to have a valid reason. And those reasons would be for hunting, if you're having repairs done, um, if you're going to be in some kind of competition or some kind of reenactment, um, if you're going to be in remote areas and you need protection from wildlife, or either if you're just going to be in transit movement, and that's going from point A to point B in a very direct route. Um, so those are the limited exceptions. Um, the other things that are restricted or prohibited are some kind of foods, some plants, some animals, um, and related products, explosives, fireworks, ammunition, cannabis. Um, and then, like I said, they, they have a website that has a whole list of, of other ones. So you certainly want to check that out to make sure, you know, that you don't have anything that should be restricted or prohibited. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and a few, um, a few comments that I'd like to add to that. Our recommendation um, at the Homeport crew is that weapons should remain at home when you are doing the Great Loop. Um, can, Karen did list some exceptions to where Canada will allow them. Um, they are very limited exceptions and they are for very specific types of firearms. Um, so I really don't wanna get into the firearm debate here, um, but the main purpose in Canada really is hunting and wildlife. And they're gonna, uh, you know, from my understanding, the exceptions are for um, things like um, shotguns, not handguns. Um, but again, we don't wanna get into that debate, but I don't want anyone to take away from this discussion that they can take their gun into Canada because there's exceptions. Um, I also believe that that's not something you can just declare when you arrive. I think pre-planning, if you do have a legitimate reason to be bringing a firearm into Canada is required. I think the approval process is, is lengthy. So just to put out there, um, like I said, I would not want anyone to walk away from listening to this podcast and think, oh, well, there's exceptions. I can just claim one of those and, and bring my weapon in. It's not an easy task. Um, and then the other thing that seems to trip people up occasionally um, and I wanna mention this um, is plants because we saw so many lovely plants at the spring rendezvous when we had about 50 looper boats there. Um, and, and a few were surprised that those are not allowed to go into Canada. So keep that in mind. I have a, a basil plant that I'll probably have to get rid of before we, we go into Canada. Um, so hopefully I can find somebody who enjoys basil to give it to. Uh, but the issue there is uh, transporting insects or other invasive species that can be in the soil of the plants. And that's the same reason for some of the foods. It's mostly vegetables and fruits and things like that that can be carrying those insects. Um, you know, everybody loves to share on the loop kind of the, the, um, the challenges, the, the horror stories, stories, so to speak. We have had people turned away at the Canadian border because they had plants aboard, had to return to the US and get rid of the plants. Um, and I think they had a particularly grumpy customs officer that day, which doesn't happen a lot, but the, the person wanted to know specifically where they had gotten rid of those plants <laughs> when they returned and were checking in with the same guy. So um, that's the reason. The other thing that I think we hear a lot about, Karen, is some of the things that you are allowed to bring in, but there are limits. And the one I'm going to point out is alcohol, because loopers do enjoy their docktails for the most part. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, typically when they ask you the... Um, amount of alcohol, you can say that you are just carrying ship stores, which is really saying that it is for your own personal use. They're just trying to make sure that you're not importing alcohol for sale. Um, so most of the times they're not really that concerned about the actual amount, but there is an amount that you can bring out in without being taxed. And, and Karen has researched all that. So um, for those who are concerned about the alcoholic beverages, Karen, what are the legal limits that you can bring in without paying import duties on that? Right. Um, you can um, bring in one of the following as personal use, and that is wine, which would be approximately two 750 milliliter bottles or an alcoholic beverage, which is a one standard bottle of liquor or a beer or ale, which would be 24 bottles or cans. So it's one of those options. Anything over that amount, then you would have to pay the additional duty and, and taxes on that. Okay, so hopefully everyone got that. Um, you know, worst case, if you are over that, you may have to pay those taxes. Um, and there are liquor stores readily available in Canada, although it can be a little bit more expensive, but those are called LCBOs in Canada. I'm not exactly clear what that stands for. Um, but when people say, oh, the LCBO is, is just down the street, that is where you can buy all of that um, since you can't bring an extended amount in. So if you need more while you're there, it's readily available. Um, 
let's see. Uh, what are the penalties, Karen? Because, um, you know, I do see on social media some people uh, sharing ways to try and, and sneak some of these items into Canada, which we highly recommend against. But uh, if you are found to have some of the restricted items, what can happen? Uh, certainly, yeah, if they're found, obviously they'll be seized and then, you know, criminal, criminal charges could be possibly charged as well. So it's a serious offense. So people certainly don't want to carry in restricted or prohibited things. Right. And, and thank you for, for sharing that because it can be a serious infraction. Um, so for those who are traveling with pets, um, we know that's not every looper, but it's, it's a good number of them. So let's just kind of highlight what the concerns would be and what they should do to make sure that they can legally bring their pet to Canada and back to the U.S. Right. Um, basically, they just need to make sure they have their rabies vaccination and have that information handy so that when they check in and they will uh, review that and make sure that the you know information about the animal matches up that the you know the description of the animal is the same as the animal that they're physically viewing and they will look at the animal make sure that they don't, they don't have any signs of illness or injury or any sort of thing like that um, now pets little puppies or small kittens that are under eight months old they may require an additional health certificate in addition to the rabies information um, but that's about it and of course um, they do allow you to bring in pet food um, so that's uh, basically, Karen, a great overview of the process and what you need to do to arrive in Canada. I did this by boat. It's been about five years now. So pre-COVID, um, like I said, there's always been a little bit of anxiety about this from some of our members. It really is a very simple process. The changes because of COVID are really on the front end and it's that Arrive Can app and filling in all that documentation and being vaccinated. Um, the only thing I, I want to add that, that I don't think we touched on is that when you do arrive in Canada and you tie up at a dock or drop anchor, um, nobody should leave the boat until you have completed the check-in process and been cleared into Canada. Um, you can call right from your cell phone on the boat to do the check-in process. Um, so it's really a very easy process. Uh, the Canadian officials are, for the most part, kind, friendly, are eager to have you visit. So they're not looking to trip you up with the questions. Um, and if you do get, you know, picked to be boarded, which is possible, you know, consider it just like at the airport when you may be that random person who gets picked, you know, for additional screening. So it is an easy process. And as most who have been there know, the Canadian waters are some of the most beautiful on the Great Loop. So don't let this process worry you too much. You will go, you'll ha have a great time. I do want to touch uh, briefly with the time we have left, Karen on the procedure for the US citizens when they are checking back into the US after they've enjoyed their time in Canada, because there is a process there as well. So kind of give right. us the, the highlight of what, what you should do. I'm kind of the same thing with going to Canada. You need to make sure that you have the um, CBB Rome app uh, installed on your smartphone or your tablet um, because you're going to enter your information in there. So once you download that, you can go ahead and download that at any time. You do have to create a, a free account, a free login.gov account in order to act, get into the app and actually add your information. But you can certainly do that. And then, then of course, the same kind of things of Canada, you have to enter your yeah, you know, enter your travel documentation, your passport and that sort of thing. And they're going to require, you know, ask some additional information about your trip and where you're from and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and at this time, there is, there are no COVID requirements, you know, to, to re-enter the United States. You don't have to have a COVID test, nor do you have to have the vaccine. So you have none of that information that you have to upload, but your other basic travel information you would upload into the app. Yeah. And that's for U.S. citizens. There is no vaccination mm -hmm. requirement. Right. Um, and to have left for Canada, you will have to have had that vaccination anyway. But for others, other citizens of other countries coming to the U.S., the rules are different and that that's not what we're covering today. But again, for Canadian members, we've got that webinar out there for you. Um, you also need a detox sticker. So tell us a little bit about that and what to do to get that. Right. That's an annual user decal fee, and that's for boats that are 30 feet or larger, um, so that's gonna be obviously all of the most looper boats. Um, it's based on a calendar year and currently the price is $30.53. Um, you can order it online. If you Google Detops, you can, it, you know, that's gonna be the first web page that's gonna list, list in the Google search. So you can quickly find it that way. Um, it is something that you have to order online and you have to receive it by mail. So obviously you need to think ahead before you go to Canada, 
Canada, it's probably best that you order it now in the U.S. before you enter Canada. Make sure you have it on hand um, as you enter, enter Canada. So you have it for your boat and you'll have that information and have that decal when you come back to the United States. Yeah, we got ours um, pretty recently. Um, the, it actually came by mail very quickly, much quicker than I expected. So, um, but you never know. So particularly since it's a mail process and the people who are on the loop doing this now, uh, we all know that mail can take a little bit to catch up with us or finding a place will be long enough. So I had mine mailed back home and then had, um, you know, somebody there send it to me when I knew we'd be in one place for a few days. But those are the kind of the, the hoops we deal with jumping through when we're on the loop. So you definitely, if you don't already have your DTOP sticker for 2022 and you're planning to go to Canada, you're going to want to do that part immediately. Um, so process for checking back into the U.S., pretty similar to the process you experience checking into Canada, but just kind of tell us, you know, what to do once you arrive at the border. Sure. It's the same type of process. You can do a, a call in or either you can do a face to face. Um, you can go to the cpb.gov website, the Custom Border Protection Agency. They do have um, locations. You can search on their website for pleasure boat locations. Um, and then it lists all the states and most loopers we know uh, check in, come back into the U.S. and in Michigan. So you can just select the state of Michigan and then it lists the, the call in numbers for Michigan and also uh, the physical face to face face to face locations that you can go to in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So you'll provide, you know, when you check in, you'll provide the same info, same information, you know, that you did arriving in Canada, your name, date of birth, citizenship, that sort of thing. Um, the name, name of your boat, your boat registration information, they will want that DTOPS um, decal number. Um, they will also want to know your home port, your current location, you know, your, your return contact information and so forth. You will have to declare your food items and your alcohol. There is no limit on alcohol coming back in the United States, but if it is a very large amount for some reason, then they will, you know, that will raise an eyebrow that that may be for commercial use. They may stop you there and, and question that. Um, you can declare merchandise. There's, uh, you know, exemptions vary but it's usually about eight hundred dollars that you can declare before you have to pay additional taxes and so forth and then the, there are restricted and prohibited goods that are very similar to what we've discussed for canada and then uh, obviously if you your pet you know you've already got the rabies vaccination so they'll be wanting to see that same type of similar documentation and then if you've used the app um, to check in then at, once they once you're clear you'll get push notifications and they'll give your information and, and send that through the app and through email and you know they'll let you know what your uh, entrance status is and they'll give you next steps and so forth so everything is you know can do it remotely you can choose to do it face to face but it'd be very easy to do it remotely okay so I guess the bottom line is the process for checking into both Canada and back into the U.S. is pretty similar both have an app that you can pre-populate with the details but coming back into the U.S., you can actually check in directly through that app where when you're going into Canada, you do need to make the phone call or appear uh, in person. So I think that's kind of the highlights. Um, there's more information on pretty much all of this on the web. And of course, in, in a podcast format, it's pretty challenging and, and completely impractical to try and provide you with those links. Um, but the upcoming Great Loop link issue will be chock full of those links. But Karen, where else can members of AGLCA go? to get those links for more info. Um, like I said, the article that's coming out in, um, next week, will have the links and then we're also gonna have a reference sheet that'll have all those links compiled together in one easy reference. And we do have that available on the website as well, so. All right, I think that covers it, Karen. I think this is gonna put a lot of people's minds at ease. So thanks for your work on making sure we were up to date on all of the rules and thanks for joining me today. Oh, you're quite welcome. And to everyone who's watched and listened today, thank you for joining us for Great Loop Radio. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, safe cruising.